I want to talk about a whole number of things, but I want to talk about miniature worlds. Mm -hmm. Because when I look at Ig Ingmar Bergman growing up, and he started creating miniature worlds in the theater, and he grew up into a Swedish filmmaker and artist who created nothing but worlds that he told stories through. And then I look at Ronnie Burkett, and your instinct from very young was to go to miniature worlds and creating the miniature theatricality, and then I see you create these worlds. Why the miniature? Uh, I think because the fascination with puppetry exists because I don't understand the big world. And as a child, I didn't really understand the big world, and I was a loner. So this craft allows me, uh, throughout my whole life, to shrink that big, confusing world into a manageable size where I can discuss it. And true, manipulate it. It's not about being a control freak, though. It really is about just understanding my species. And, and for me to do that, it's best just to make it a bit smaller and manageable and then throw it back to the world and go, here's what I think of us. What do you think of what I think of us? And when you were young and your first fascination started with the form, was it a place to escape? No, I, I think I already had escaped. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I was a loner pretty much from the get-go and, and really enjoyed spending time by myself. But, you know, that gets a bit boring if you don't have something to daydream about constantly. Right. So when I discovered puppetry, I was seven. And uh, I think the first fascination is the continuing fascination. I looked at a picture of a puppeteer and his wife in the World Book Encyclopedia and instantly said to myself, that's it, that's what I'll do. Because I understood, even at the age of seven, that here was uh, a way to combine all of my interests, making things, making funny voices, telling stories, uh, playing characters, and, and I just instinctively knew that puppetry was the way to do that for me. And that fascination continued through all of my development. Um, even in theater school, you know, I was pulled aside in theater school uh, and, and sat down and told, okay, you will only ever play roles based upon this height, this skin color, this gender, and maybe five years younger and five years older. And by the way, you'll always be cast as the goofy friend of the leading man. And I thought, well, that, you know, I've already been doing stuff where I'm Rapunzel and the big bad wolf and the witch and the leading man. So I think I already found um, an unlimited form of theater. Which theater school? <laughs> Brigham Young University. Really? Yeah, go figure. And that didn't went, last very long. And how long were you there? Uh, less than a year. And you were there as an actor? Yeah. Student? Yeah. And you left? I, I, I left and was encouraged to leave. <laughs> okay. You were, and how was that? Because, yeah, it, the bumps that artists get along the way sometimes put them in touch with something deeper that they want, yeah. rather than, you're a failure as an acting student, get out, Mr. Well, Roberts. and you know, going to a religious university too, and, and starting to think that, uh, you know, I wasn't raised Mormon, my high school drama teacher was a Mormon, and my best friend in high school was a Mormon, and I thought, oh, well, I'll go along with this for a while, but um, uh, they told me also at one point that they trained people to uh, teach theater, not be in the theater. You know, they really didn't want uh, uh, their graduates to be in the decadent world of the professional theater. And I thought, well, that's not going to work for me. Um, and I remember uh, one night in my dorm room at Brigham Young University writing a desperate letter to Bill Baird who was the man who did the puppets in The Sound of Music. But he was also the man who was in that first picture in the World Book Encyclopedia. And I wrote him a desperate letter saying, your book at the end says it's the duty to train the new ones and pass it along. Well, I'm the new one. Please get me out of here and hire me. Um, That's book. So I, well, I'd been writing Bill since I was uh, seven years old. Um, and he later told me that he had all those letters. I wrote him when I was 10 and said, um, I'm perfectly fine to leave my family and move to New York and work with you. And never got a response, which really bugged me. So I wrote him again when I was 14 and said, you know, seriously, I can leave home now and come live in Manhattan and live with you and, you know, be your protege. And never got a response. And he, sir, sir you're, you're a small boy in Medicine Hat. Yeah. Writing a, a, a master in New York and he's not responding because 
he thinks is inappropriate or he doesn't know who you are or... Well, I, I just, you know, if I got a letter right now from a seven or a ten year old <laughs> saying I'm going to move in and leave my family, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't really say, yeah, come. I mean, I, I wrote a lot of puppeteers and uh, uh, half a dozen of them wrote me back, which I instantly took as an invitation to be part of their life. So starting when I was about 14, I would spend Easter break or summer holidays part of um, going and sleeping in their houses and picking their brains. I, I would invite myself. And some of them actually didn't say no. And God love my parents, they would put a 14 year old on a plane and send him off to Detroit to live in the inner city of Detroit with a couple of puppeteers. I, you know, who, who would do that now? Nobody would do that. So what did your parents think of all this? You know, my parents had a great ability to never say yay, yes, but they never once said no, which I think is the most miraculous thing about my parents. I think they thought I would outgrow it. You know, that this would never come to fruition and who was going to be a puppeteer anyway. But then, you know, when I was about 14, I started making those lucrative $50 gigs. Um, so I think my dad, just being middle class, went, oh, there's something in this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, art works. Yeah. Here's the check. Yeah. Your stories, a lot of darkness in them. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of end of things in them. They're raunchy, they're intelligent. They're funny, they're ribald, they're satirical. How do you come to this? Is this just Ronnie Unleashed? I think so. <laughs> I think that's all it is. You know, especially with this, you know, while we're sitting here on the stage of Factory Theatre, it's funny, this week I've been feeling like, I think audiences just think I'm a dark weirdo. I think they just kind of leave going, ooh. He's a weirdo. <laughs> you know, I stand up on stage every day and go, I'm an old lady, I'm a dog, I'm going to kill you, you know, smother my mother with a pillow. But I just, you know, I'm just telling my stories. And, and like I said earlier, for me, puppetry is a, an examination of my species. Most puppeteers don't make little people. And most of the old puppet books actually say, do not make little people make things that people can't do. So make lots of talking animals, make inanimate objects come to life, make gargoyles and demons and witches and fantastic creatures that the human theater can't replicate as well. And that's kind of the official party line in puppetry. So what do I go and do? I not only do shows for adults where I'm in full view, I make little people, um, which is in a way, really old-fashioned and really avant-garde all at the same time. Because, you know, we live in a time where puppetry is supposed to be big and it's supposed to be animals and it's uh, not supposed to be making little people. I only want to make little people. It's my way to examine us and talk about my species.